Assalamualaikum and a good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Razak School of Government's 13th webinar in 2021, our 26th installment in total. Today's webinar is called Managing Teams, a year on since the pandemic. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few housekeeping items and the structure of our webinar session today. To those who follow this webinar through Zoom, please mute your microphones. We are also broadcasting this webinar live on our Facebook. This webinar session is divided into three segments. First, we will begin with key questions posed to our guest speaker. Then we will answer questions from participants. At any time during the webinar, you may submit your questions to the guest speaker. Just type your questions in the chat and comment section. Please keep your questions short and straightforward. As time allows, we will address as many questions as possible. Lastly, we will then wrap up today's webinar session. This webinar is recorded and you will be able to assess this recording via our Facebook and YouTube page. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our guest speaker. Dr. Kishore Sengupta is a professor of operations management at Judge Business School, University of Cambridge. His current research, teaching and consulting activities are focused on managing complex projects, managing complexity in organizations, and the future of work in the age of technological discontinuity. Dr. Kishore's academic and professional career has been, has been in organizations in the United Kingdom, United States, France, Hong Kong, and India. Before coming to Cambridge in 2014, Dr. Kishore held faculty positions at INSEAD in France, the Naval Postgraduate School, Monterey, California, USA, and the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. He has also worked at the AT&T Network Software Center and Ernst & Young. His responsibilities have included serving as advisor on compact projects with large organization and the US government Department of Defense. His consulting activities involve organization in Europe, Asia, and United States. Dr. Kishaw has published in top journals in various academic disciplines, as well as in the business literature. For example, the Harvard Business Review, Financial Times, and European Business Review. Among them is a widely acclaimed article in the Harvard Business Review on how managers fail to learn from experience. Dr. Kishaw has also won several awards, including a European Case Clearing House Case Award in the Knowledge Information and communications system management category. Through the Judge Business School, Dr. Kishore contributed immensely to RSOG Senior Leadership Program, Policy Leadership and Strategic Change Series. He also helped to facilitate the new H Leadership Program, a collaboration between RSOG, Judge Business School, and the Public Service Department of Sabah. Dr. Kishore authored an article Managing in Times of the Pandemic in RSOG Insight Movement Control Order Edition in April 2020. Dr. Kishore, let us get started. The first question to the guest speaker is, what matters in managing teams? Dr. Kishore, microphone is yours. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Johari, and thank you for the very uh, warm welcome um, and the very generous introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm, I'm very, very happy to be here. And it's, it's a bit unfortunate that I, I cannot be at Kuala Lumpur. And there is nothing I would have liked more than to be in KL at this time of the year. So, but be that as it may, we are still together and we are still um, kind of face to face. Uh, so let us get started with uh, a very, very uh, interesting and I think a difficult question about teams. <clears throat> what does it take to manage teams? I think it's useful to look back and, and, and see what our experiences have been in teams. And we've been looking at teams for the better part of 75 to 80 years. And this has been in the context of many different teams. So for example, uh, the, the teams that are in the government, all the way to teams that perform surgeries in, in the operating theaters. Now, uh, and the military and, and, and various other disciplines. Some findings are absolutely unambiguous. One is most teams actually do not work that well. And there are many reasons for it. I will just note some of the reasons. One of them is that either the goals are not clear 
or the goals are not shared by people. Second is a lack of clarity in roles and responsibilities. Third is lack of flexibility in how we make decisions despite evidence to the contrary. Number four is how leadership is conducted and how processes of the team are being conducted. And a couple of others are insufficient inclusion in decision making. So as a team member, do I feel that my input is being valued? And the final bit, which I think is the most important one, is a failure to develop open communications with team members. So these deficiencies are there in most teams that I have, I have uh, studied. What happens is that we go along, we muddle along, and somehow we get things done, and then we go on to the next team. Now, these deficiencies become absolutely visible and absolutely clear when something has gone wrong. So, for example, the distinction between success and failure is actually very slim. Or what has happened is that it's a crisis situation, and if the team doesn't deliver to really high performance, that becomes a bit of a problem. Okay? So, I have concluded that um, what it takes to manage teams has many elements to it, but I think one important element is to create structure around how we create teams and how we then manage the teams. Now, what is the structure to this? I think the structure has a few elements, and I will go through these in turn, but the most important element of the structure, there are three very important elements, and then I'll talk, and I'll also talk about the others. I will highlight what I think are the really important elements. <clears throat> The first one is a goal. Now, <clears throat> most teams uh, ostensibly have a goal, and we have targets, or we have KPIs, and we have all kinds of uh, mechanisms which, um, which, which lead us to think we have goals. However, <clears throat> goals are, I think, a lot more difficult than just uh, putting it down on a piece of paper. Let me give you an example. So some years ago, I was facilitating the, uh, a retreat of uh, very senior executives of a very large technology company. And what had happened is that the board had changed the strategy somehow, somewhat. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> the board had changed uh, the strategy. So the top executives of the, tier of, of the company were put together and they were asked to take each pillar of the strategy and then cascade it down. So I was asked to facilitate one such team. There were six teams altogether. And my team had six people in it, very, very bright. These are among the best in the world in terms of managerial capability. And the goal that was given to them was on a PowerPoint slide. It had about four bullets in it. So they all looked at the goal and they said, actually, this is quite simple. Uh, so let's move on. And they started creating plans. They started creating plans about when they would meet and what resources they would need. Uh, so I stopped them. I said, but you haven't had to uh, chat about the goal itself. She said, it's very obvious. So I said, please humor me, go around the table, and in two sentences, try to explain what do you understand the goal to be. So when we went around the table, what turned out is that each individual had a very different characterization of the goal. So this is what I'm talking about. The goal may seem very clear. In reality, <clears throat> different, people, um, different people interpret the goal very differently. So I, I think the most important thing in a team is a goal. And the goal has to be clear, it has to be compelling, and it, it has to be something that everyone understands and everyone shares. Uh, one more anecdote, and this gets to... Um, so recently, uh, I, I saw a piece of news, which is that the Russians are in space. They have sent a film, a film crew, and they will make the first film in space. I go back to about um, 60 years, and this was 1961. Uh, the Russians had already gone to space, and they were going to go to the moon. And the Americans got quite concerned that they would get there first. So what John F. Kennedy did is to give a speech. And the speech had the following sentence. We will put a man on the moon, bring him back to Earth before the decade is out. So in other words, a time frame of nine years. That is what you call a clear and a compelling goal. So when you have a clear goal, what it does do is that it motivates people. They understand the goal, they get behind the goal, and if the goal is clear, the steps to the goal also become quite a bit clearer. However, <clears throat> it's, it's, it's important to make sure that the goal is something which is realistic. So the goal has to be based on what I call um, a very good understanding of our competencies, our values. 
are we really capable of fulfilling the goal? And I can tell you, I've seen many teams which have been given a goal, which is actually quite clear, but the goal is unrealistic. The team takes a look at the goal and says that I cannot fulfill the goal. We cannot fulfill the goal and they freeze. So it's very important the goal has to be realistic. It has to be based on the level of competence that is there on the team. It's fine to say that actually we are not good at this yet, but then work towards what it will take to fulfill the goal instead of pretending that we, everything is okay, we can fulfill the goal. Okay, <clears throat> so I've talked about two things so far. One is a clear goal and a goal based on values-based competency. Now, once the goal is clear, I think it's very important to get uh, two other things absolutely clear. One is roles. And the roles mean that do the individuals in the team understand what they're supposed to do? Are they chosen on the basis of the skills? And are the roles so clear that you almost don't have to communicate exactly what they're what they supposed to do? Because if they are not clear about the roles, then how are they going to act when something happens? What they will typically do is to say, actually, this is not my job, and this is somebody else's job. So role clarity is very, very important. The second point I want to make is that a team, just like anything else in an organization, a team needs to have processes. And what kinds of processes are, are we talking about? A clear understanding of how we make decisions, how we handle crises, how we handle conflicts, how do we go about innovating, how do we go about learning, and how do we go about making ourselves better over a period of time. So together, we should sit down and we should define our processes in such a way that we all agree to the processes, we all agree to how we will conduct ourselves. So now I've talked about four elements. We started with goals, but the goals have to be driven by competencies. But once we have the goal, we should be clear about the roles and the processes. Now in the time that is left, I will talk about <coughs> two ground rules. And one of them is what I call the rules of the road. Now imagine that um, you are driving <coughs> on a road which is actually very, very narrow and it's on the top of a mountain. So on the other side is a cliff. It's an abyss. And there are many such roads all over the world. And imagine that there's a big truck which is coming from the other side and there is not enough space for both vehicles to go through. Now there are many ways of dealing with the situation. One is to be clear that actually we both need to go through, let's find a way to work with each other. The other one could be that the truck could say, you know what, I'm a truck, you are a small car, or I'm a military truck, you're a small car, or I work for the government, you don't work for, I don't know who you work for, so you need to give me way. Now, if that happens, that is a recipe for disaster. So that is what I mean by rules of the road. So there has to be a very clear understanding of what happens inside a team. I will go and talk about one aspect of a team which I think is very, very important where we need to be clear about the rules of the road. In every team, what happens is that we get a group of very, very high performing individuals. They're better than anyone else. But because they're better than anyone else, they tend to behave like this big truck that I was talking about. You know what? I am the big shot. I am the one who really knows how to do it. You need to make way for me. So for example, boss, I cannot come tomorrow afternoon. The boss says, well, you know, he's really good. Okay, I'll give him tomorrow afternoon off. But then somebody else says, actually, can I have tomorrow afternoon off? No, 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 we cannot have tomorrow afternoon off because we have a very important client meeting. I think you get to the point of what I'm trying to say, that some team members tend to behave differently from that of the others because of perceptions that they are the big truck, that they are high performers. And the team leaders take a look at them and say, okay, you know what they do? They are high performers. I will give them flexibility. It's not a question of giving flexibility. What happens is that the other members of the team feel that this is inequitous and they lose morale, they lose faith, they lose motivation. So it's very important to make clear the rules of the road. Give flexibility, but make sure that flexibility is available on the basis of performance. So make sure that uh, you don't get the notion that I have a big truck and therefore I will behave exactly as I want. Rather, a high performer will be rewarded with flexibility is another way to think about it. The final bit is about the individual, which I think is the most important one. So why am I saying it right at the end? I think there's a reason. So we can be nice to each other. We can take care of each other, but if the goals are not clear, if the roles are not clear, if the processes are not clear, if the rules of the road are not clear, if it is not clear that we can even do it, we don't build trust with each other. So at the end of the day, 
trust and cohesion and a faith in each other is very important. But the structure that I've talked about enables us to actually create the trust and the faith in each other. So in other words, for individuals to take care of each other. So in summary, I've talked about, I started with goals. And then I said that actually goals need to be realistic and they need to be driven by competencies. Goals should lead to very clear roles. Goals should also lead to very clear processes in a way that everybody shares and understands not only the goals, but also the roles and the processes. All of this should be done in the context of very, very clear rules of the road in terms of how we behave with each other, how we treat each other, and what happens when uh, we perform well in terms of the flexibility and, and so on. And the final bit is that at the end of the day, we are all individuals. We need to treat each other well, but that can only be done if you have a very clear structure. So I will end uh, this where, where I started, which is that I think teams need a structure and this structure needs to be put into place. And I hope the elements of the structure that I've put together make sense to you. I'll obviously be very happy to follow up uh, during the chat. So, uh, Excellent, so Dr. Kishok. Uh, allow us to go to the second question for Dr. Kishok. The, question, the second question is, how has the pandemic affect managing teams? Okay. <clears throat> So there are many, many, many different uh, ways of thinking about it. I will just um, focus on one element, and that is about the uh, challenges of remoteness. So for example, if you look at the situation we are in, we are all remote from each other. So we are a remote team today, and we are in different parts of the world. Now, uh, remoteness obviously has effects, and I will talk about some of these. So you, we can think about remoteness in terms of it has an effect on people, it has an effect on processes, and it has an effect on structure, right? Now, I will talk about <clears throat> the essence of decision-making in teams. Now, if you think about all the things that we do are based on something that we want to accomplish. So in other words, we take actions. So for example, if we are in a sales team, we create a sales proposition. If we are working for <clears throat> a public policy organization, we formulate policies on, for example, vaccination. If we are, <clears throat> working for the military, then we formulate actions on if there's a threat to the border. And we do this all the time. Now, actions lead to outcomes. And outcomes could be sometimes they are good, sometimes not so good, and all of that stuff. And we know the outcomes based on the feedback that we get. So for example, we may have plans for vaccination. And just like in many countries, uh, we observe that some people don't want to get vaccinated, right? So that's an outcome, and we get feedback on why people don't want to get vaccinated. And then what happens is that we reflect on it and reflect on it. And when then we say, how do we solve the problem that some people don't want to get vaccinated? And then we take the next set of actions. So this is a loop in which most of the, most teams are. Now, the loop and the actions depend on who you are and what you're trying to do. But the loop remains the same for everyone. In remoteness, what happens to the loop? I think there are at least two elements that are worth mentioning. And if there is time, I will say a few more things. I think what happens is when we are face to face and when we are not remote, uh, we talk to each other. <clears throat> we may sometimes not like each other, but we talk to each other. And when we talk to each other, we understand where the other person is coming from. So in other words, when we exchange information, when we are trying to, trying to formulate decisions, when we are trying to understand where the other people are coming from, then being face to face, as an ability which we do not have when we are remote. And what happens as a result is what I call latency or delays. So in other words, imagine that <clears throat> you and I are working together on something. So we have this conversation, right? And we are not face to face. And at some point of time, I would say, actually, you know what? Let me think about it a little bit. And can we set up another Zoom call? Uh, when are we going to set up a Zoom call? Let's take a look at our calendars. And the Zoom call is next week. So we've already lost a week. Whereas had we been face to face, we could have had the conversation and we could have been done. Maybe it would take another hour, but we would have been done. So how we exchange information and how we process information, uh, because we are remote in the pandemic, that takes time. Second is when people don't know each other and when they work across hierarchies, that becomes even more complicated. So every organization has hierarchies, they have status, and they have all kinds of such divisions, if you will, for example, silos. Now, when we are face-to-face, -face, we can put people together in rooms. And yes, there is hierarchy, it doesn't disappear, 
but at least we can get conversations going. When we are remote, it's even harder to figure out where the hierarchies are. So for example, <clears throat> well, um, I've, I've been in many sessions with uh, my colleagues from Razak, uh, and I understand my colleagues from Razak and, 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 and the civil service, so I got to understand you know, hierarchies, I got to understand, uh, for example, you know, who makes what decisions and all that stuff. Because we were face to face, we had lunches, we had conversations and so on. Remotely, I would have absolutely no understanding of how the government works or what the role of Iraq is and all that. Yes, there are pieces of paper, they're documents, but they're not enough. Similarly, when you're dealing with another organization, for example, client, you have no idea what the hierarchies are. You're trying to guess and all of that stuff. So it takes time and another element of latency. So eventually what happens is that because we are not with each other, the decisions do not have the same quality and they take a longer time. The second aspect I want to stress is the notion of tacitness. Now, <clears throat> what does that mean? It simply means this. So for example, uh, I'll give one example, Johari, if you don't mind. Uh, so we, we go back a long way. You know, we've worked with each other for a long time. So when you know, Johari says something to me, I actually understand what he's talking about in a way which is more than what he's, more than the words because there is a tacitness, there is context. I understand where Johari comes from, what he does, and he also understands what Kishore, where Kishore comes from and what he does. So much of what we do at relatively senior levels of leadership or in any team is really about tacit knowledge, exchanging tacit knowledge about the organization, about the challenges, about work, about sharing knowledge, sharing information. All of that has an element of softness and tacitness which really is a lifeblood of high quality work. So there's a lot of work which can be done on a piece of paper, exchanging information on pieces of paper, but I would say that that is no more than 20, 25% at relatively high levels. The other 75% is purely tacit. Now imagine when people are not face to face, okay? Tacitness has a big price. Uh, and tacitness means that we cannot talk to each other quite as well. Sometimes we don't know each other and because of which the knowledge base exchanges suffer. And this also has effect on decisions, which is the quality of the decisions and the time. And in the pandemic, I saw it many times that people would make decisions, people would turn out outputs. And I could see that the output actually would have been much better had they been able to talk to each other, had they been able to share tacit knowledge, have rich, rich discussions in a way that, you know, body language tells you a lot and so on. Now, uh, the last bit I will say is I will give an example of what is the difference between face-to-face uh, -face and otherwise, which I think the pandemic brought to bear. So on the one hand, um, this is great, right? I'm here in uh, Cambridge, you're in uh, KL or in other parts of Malaysia, and we can all talk. So let's be clear that um, electronic platforms at least allow us to talk, allow us to see each other, and that is useful. So given that, now what I will do is I will focus on what is lost. <clears throat> okay, so I will talk about uh, the British Broadcasting Corporation. And what had happened is that in the 70s and 80s, these were the golden years of the BBC. BBC is still a very a good organization. But at that period of time, it came out with a group of television serials, movies, dramas, and feature features that were unmatched. You know, the output that came out was absolutely unmatched. All of that came out from a, bed, a building, a series of buildings in a place called White City. And White City is in, near Shepherd's Bush, which is the western part of London. Uh, that building no longer exists. It's become a hotel. Now, what has happened is that people would see each other. They would talk to each other. They would fight with each other. They would have exchanges with each other. And out of that would come serendipity. Why don't we think of this idea? Why don't we think of that idea? You know what? This idea is actually a really bad idea, but I, I really like that part. Can we... Let me talk about it tomorrow. So serendipity is the lifeblood of creativity in organizations. And when we don't see each other, we cannot have these conversations. And I think the pandemic made it very clear. Now, many years ago, I will say two more things and then I will stop. Many years ago, um, I'm talking of 1968, that long ago, a researcher in MIT um, did a study on why people collaborate. Most of us don't have to collaborate uh, serendipitously. We only do it because we... Uh, we do it, right? So uh, interesting ideas and exchanges. Um, so he, he looked at um, or how why people collaborate, and he came up with one variable. And the variable was how far they are from each other in the office environment. 
And then he showed that if you are more than 20 meters, in other words, you don't even see the other person, uh, then it's very unlikely that you will collaborate. So it's a curve which goes like this and becomes flat. Now, that was a long time ago, before electro electronic media, before technology uh, in many ways, right? So a similar study was done in 2017 or 2018, I'm forgetting, by a Harvard PhD student, and he came up with exactly the same, uh, not exactly, but a very, very similar outcome. Remember, by then, we had Zoom, we had telepresence, we had WebEx, we have all the technologies that we are using now, and still face-to-face -face matters because there is serendipity. The final bit is, there's a new study which has come out, and I think it's the most definitive study I have seen on how the pandemic has affected remote work. And this came out of uh, a, a data set from Microsoft, and it's in a very recent issue of Nature. And they found that what, it has, what the pandemic has done to teams is that it has, it has reduced social networks, it has reduced information sharing, it has reduced the sharing of tacit knowledge, and it has also reduced creativity. So this is the challenge of the pandemic, one challenge of the pandemic, which is the notion of remoteness. On the one hand, I think it's great that we can get things done, like now. On the other hand, let's also be clear that there are, there's a very clear price to pay, and this price only gets bigger the longer we go on. So let me stop there. I'm obviously very happy to catch up on, on this and questions that we have on this. So, okay. Thank you, Dr. Kishore. Yeah. We'll go to the last question to the guest speaker. What are the consequences of this in the longer term, Dr. Kishore? Okay, <clears throat> so the challenges of the pandemic. Now, um, what has happened is that, um, uh, so, you know, for us academics, the pandemic has also created interesting opportunities. Uh, and what are the opportunities? The opportunities are that we get to study what organizations are doing. And I've been amazed as to how well many organizations have really coped. And this is all over the place, right? We are talking of the organizations of the government. We are talking of organizations in nonprofit, public policy organizations, and certainly law and the various professional service organizations. I would even say universities such as us, right? So that, I think, is a positive part. And to the extent that it continues, that's good. Now, what's the other side of the pandemic? I will talk about culture. And specifically, I will talk about norms and practices. Now, there are many ways of looking at culture. And uh, simply, uh, let, me, let me define this a little bit. Uh, if you think about culture in any organization, including uh, the organizations to which you belong, culture is a set of shared beliefs and values. So this is what we stand for. This is what we do. And this is how we treat each other. So for example, some organizations are more hierarchical because they accept that that's how it is. Some organizations are a bit flatter because that's, they accept that's how it is. Some organizations are very clear in roles and responsibilities, others are not. So for example, I work for the University of Cambridge. It is very decentralized. And if you tomorrow, if you wanted to make it centralized, I think you would fail because that's, uh, that's how we treat each other. That's how we work with each other. But the shared beliefs and values lead to practices. So the shared beliefs and values lead to norms as to how we treat, treat each other. And they lead to practices, how we work with each other. So now what has happened is that in the pandemic, uh, I think some of these practices have started shifting. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, what I mean is this, that imagine I work for a reasonably large organization, the University of Cambridge, and there are many people here. And so I have a network, and imagine that I have just, um, imagine that I have not been here for long. Now, in that network of people, there are some people that I see more often than others. Sometimes I see them face to face. Sometimes I see them in remote. What happens to the other individuals in the network? They start disappearing from my mind. So in other words, I may have a very rich network one day. Bit by bit by bit, the network starts atrophying and becomes concentrated. And the analogy I would use is also an analogy that we are all familiar with. So imagine before the pandemic, we went to work. We, we, we took, a, took transport, we flew and so on. We got our bodies moving. During the pandemic, we sat in our seats, tried working as hard as we could, and some of our muscles have atrophied, so we had to go and exercise and all that. But frankly, I think some of these diseases will start coming up. Similarly, our networks in our own heads, our connections and our networks and people we see, people we talk to have started atrophying, which basically is not very good news. 
because remember almost everything we do is really about ideas. The flow of ideas and how the ideas morph, who we talk to and how much attention we give. And therefore the shape of the network and the diversity of the network that we carry in our heads is very, very important. The proposition I would put to you is this. The pandemic has concentrated our minds, has made us more focused, but at the same time what it has done is it has reduced serendipity, it has reduced tacitness, and it has reduced our, our urge and our, and our need to actually reach out to many different parts of a network because we don't see them, right? Sometimes we say, you know what, I haven't talked to so-and-so for a long time, let me maybe connect on LinkedIn, or I haven't talked to so-and-so for a long time, maybe on WhatsApp, but these are deliberate actions. Networks are not also about deliberate actions. They're about people seeing each other on the streets, people seeing each other in the offices, having a chat and all that. And if the longer we go without it, I think the shape of the networks start changing. Now that is for us who have worked in organization. Imagine there are new recruits. All of you have recruited new people. So my wife joined uh, one organization in October and she's leaving for another job in December. Now she started remote, so she, she used to go to work sometimes. Uh, so she knows a handful of people and by the time she leaves, she will know a few people. I don't think she really understands the organization because she has only been there she has gotten the work done and done it well. And now she's found another, another job uh, based on that. So this is good, right? But does she really understand the organization? I don't think so. Imagine there are people who have joined the organization who actually don't understand what the organization is for. A sense of belonging, a sense of purpose, a sense of identity, and a sense of pride in what we are and who we belong to. So what I'm trying to say is this that the longer the pandemic lasts, the less contact with her we have with each other. Even when we resume, I think it's very important to understand that our perceptions matter and our perceptions then carry over into behaviors. If our perceptions lead us to create networks which are either skewed or which are a little bit twisted or the networks are not that very rich, then these are also behaviors. We will not interact with a lot of other people. We will not interact with, with, with many, 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 many others and what does that do to the organization? The organization is an organization because we belong, because we share beliefs, because we share values. And somehow the fact that we are not working with each other in the way that we used to, somehow I think makes us a little bit more transactional, makes us believe a little bit less in the values of the organization. Because after all, nothing at the end of it is abstract. This has to be something that we, we, we practice. So, what does it mean for leaders? I think there are three things to watch out for. When you're establishing and maintaining a team culture, the team may have actually been very good in the past, but don't take organizations' norms for granted. Behaviors and practices evolve, and they have evolved over the pandemic, and I think it's your job as leader of the team leader, as the leader of the team, to make sure that the behaviors are the ones that you really want. Please don't take their norms for granted increase transparency, increase sharing, you know, give people a sense of what the real norms are, especially the ones who have newly joined the team. Give people a sense of what the team is really for. So please work on norms. Please work on the organizational norms and don't take them for granted. Once upon a time, you didn't even need to say it, but now you have to say it. And you have to say it again and again and again. Reiterate and practice this. So please spend quite a lot of time thinking about the organization norms and how these, are going to, these can be transmitted to the team. So the idea is to rebuild the team culture. Think of it as a kind of physiotherapy. You know, you know we have surgery, right? Knee replacement or whatever it is. The doctor says, you know, you need to go walk. Don't sit. You need to go walk no matter how painful. It's like that. Back to physiotherapy in terms of organizational norms. The second one is who carries the culture forward? Look, in organizations are good. They're effective. It's a team. It's not the boss. The boss can say everything the boss wants. But at the end of it, it, the team behaves in a certain way. And that's the culture of the organization. Make the team responsible. Okay, give the team flexibility. Give the team enough bandwidth. So give them an opportunity to work with each other. And bit by bit by bit, as people come back to the office, give them a little bit of reason to be with each other as opposed to only work, right? We have become too work focused, is what I'm trying to say. Ask the team to discuss. You know, focus back on goals, norms, rules of the road. 
back to the notion of physiotherapy. In this case, what is the physiotherapy that you would do for carrying the team's culture forward? And the final point I will make is this, that you have to make the culture visible by calling it out. So I go back to the example of BBC and White City. So what happened is that the buildings became old and the BBC then moved them to many different parts of the country, to Manchester, Salford, to London, this, that and the other. A lot of people don't see each other anymore. They see small groups of people. And I think it has had a noticeable impact on the quality of the programs. Now they have a lot of, and in the meantime, they have many competitors like Netflix and others. So I think it's the job of the leader to stitch it back together. So in the absence of workplace cues, you are left with communicating and reinforcing culture directly rather than through artifacts. The building no longer exists. The coffee rooms don't exist. You know, the shared spaces don't exist anymore. So now it's your job to create a sense of all of these, right? Second is call attention to behavior and online interaction that represent your firm's culture and re remind people why those behaviors matter. And you see this in Zoom, right? Some people are terrific. Others step back and they are not interacting. Try to find out why without making it dictatorial. Try to find out how. And I think it's, it's really your, your calling to do this. And then discourage people from uh, practices that depart from the firm's desired culture. For example, people rudely, interact, uh, uh, rudely interrupting on Zoom. The quieter people not getting an opportunity to share. And those kinds of things, you know, people not exchanging uh, thoughts with each other and so on. So what I'm saying is that in the vacuum that is left, and it's going to be there for a long time, even when people come back to work, I think a series of uh, sets of physiotherapy, and I've talked about three things, right? One is norms. Don't take it for granted. Revisit the norms. Second is culture. The, the team's culture. Let the team take them forward and do everything you can to make that happen. And the final bit is make the culture visible by calling it out. So let me stop right there. I'm over by two minutes, uh, Johari. Sorry about that, but I'm ready to take questions uh, and any, any observations that, that you have. Thank you very much, Dr. Kishore, for a very insightful response to the key questions. There are a lot of new things that you introduced here that we could use as a guidance in leading at work. The, the part that you say about the network, uh, I must tell you that despite the pandemic over one and a half years, you are still in, in our mind. You are not disappearing from our mind. And <laughs> thank you. <laughs> we're always looking forward to collaborate with you. Uh, your sharing has triggered a lot of questions, Dr. Kishore. I will try to cover as many as possible. Okay. Let me cover, let me read the first one from Rahima. Dr. Rahima is asking you, how do we look for the soul of the role? The, I'm sorry, how do we look for? How do we look the soul, S O U L, of the role? soul of the role? <clears throat> that's a very, very interesting question. Um, so that's actually a great question. I think a lot of the times the rules are defined in very mechanistic terms. And so this is what you do and these are the steps you take and you come to work this day, these are your hours and all that. All that is good. Don't get me wrong. I think it's always better to connect uh, that with, I think, three things, right? One is what do you bring to the table? In other words, uh, your capabilities. Second is what is your passion? Okay, which part of the role really excites you, really interests you? That's number two. And number three is, which part of the role are you actually not good at because we want to develop you, right? So I think, I think that's the sort of the role that connected with what, uh, what excites people and what, uh, what they're good at, but also connecting it in a way with what they're not so good at, they're a little bit a sense of discomfort that we're not so good at it, uh, but the organization or my leader is going to make me a little bit better. And once that is connected, I think what you will get is a level of motivation, commitment, which is hard to get if you simply give people a list of things to do. Yeah. Dr. Kishore, I'll take two questions together from Hazri and from Marhada because it's quite related. Okay. Hazri is asking where would team alignment fall under the element of structure that you mentioned? And Marhada question is how do you break silos in a working environment? Okay. <clears throat> All right. So, so these are these are both work in progress, right? I think there are things you can do, and sometimes you have to uh, also admit that there are things you cannot do. So, team align. Let's get to team alignment. I think team alignment. Uh, um, I th I think uh, I think there are two aspects that I think you you absolutely need to work on. 
uh, one is goals and the goals themselves have two elements. So one of the elements is if you have, let us say, three or four goals, what is a goal that's a priority? Because if the team doesn't see that you have a clear sense of priorities, they cannot align to the goal, right? So that's number one. You need to define a set of priorities and you need to make it clear. The second one I think is more tricky and I think maybe that's where your question is coming from and here it is. So individuals have their own goals and the team has its goals and these have to be in alignment. Now we can all say, look, you work for the team and you're completely for the team and this and that, but you, you and I all know that we want our own goals to be clarified. Now I think this is a matter of discussion between you and the team member and I think both of you have to be clear and honest with each other as to what the individual's goals are. And once you have an honest discussion, I think the trick is to find enough of a convergence that uh, you can get the work done. Because if you don't have the discussion, the individual is thinking, you know what, I don't really care about the team goal. I'll just do what I want, right? And you can't really blame them for that. Um, if you have the discussion and then you find out the individual is not with the team goal, you can do something about it, right? Including, you know, uh, asking the individual to move to another team. But if you don't have the discussion, I think it becomes quite difficult uh, for you to understand where they're coming from, from them to understand, you know, what your priorities are and what your goals are. So I would always say that the group goals and the individual goals are not the same thing. I think it's very, very important to have a discussion around that. It's very important to accept that uh, there may not be a complete convergence. And if there is no convergence, then do something about it. Now, what happens is that in high-performing organizations, you actually get individuals who really want uh, things only for themselves. And, you know, I work with one such organization, which is uh, the Mercedes Formula One team, the Petronas, the Mercedes Petronas Formula One team, which has won how many, you know, how many world championships. So if you look at uh, the top drivers in 2016, Lewis Hamilton and Nico Rosberg clashed with each other and both cars were destroyed because they both want to be world champions. In the meantime, they are both out of the race. And this happened in Barcelona, right? And at that point of time, the head of the team, Nicky Lauda, basically told them, look, if this happens again, I will tear up your contracts and you will be out of the team. So draw, the, draw these lines. So I think, uh, I, think, I think I hope the point makes sense that, you know, you need to work on alignment. It is not automatic. You cannot dictate, but you need to be clear about where you stand. In terms of roles, I often find this to be a challenge because people are asked to do everything, but they can't do everything, right? You can give them enough, enough uh, variety in the jobs that it's enriching, but you also have to draw some boundaries. And this is your job as a team leader, that, that you know, they will align with each other. They know that I'm supposed to do this, 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 and that, but on the boundary, it's something else. There are other people who will do this. And I think it's a handover, it's the boundaries, which become a problem in, in, in a team. And this, if you connect with the earlier question of the sort of the role, I would say make the roles, uh, give it variety, give it diversity, but also put boundaries around it so that there is alignment among many members of the team. Um, the notion of silos is a more tricky one. Um, I think I would ask the question, why, the, why is there a silo in the first place? And I think the answer is may not be what you want to hear. I think silos actually perform. Um, uh, silos are actually pretty effective in what they do. What happens sometimes is that we find it that when we try to do something which spans two silos, so for example, two different ministries, it becomes a problem. And, 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 and I've seen this many times. This happens in banks. This happens in our own universities. It happens everywhere, right? So I think first, let's acknowledge that each of these silos is actually doing something well. Second is now let's acknowledge, you know, which parts of the silos really need to work with each other and then work on those parts. What I'm trying to say is that let's be a bit more pragmatic in dealing with silos because if you're trying to crack, if you're trying to collapse the silos, I think this is enormously difficult because silos are there for a reason, right? Uh, if you're trying to collapse them, I think you will find it very difficult. On the other hand, if you're pragmatically dealing with two departments and you're trying to make something work, define the points of interaction. Get the people together in such a way that, and, 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 and make sure there's enough of an incentive and, and, and put the culture together in such a way that they work with each other. So, so that's, I think, so, so the idea is to be pragmatic. The idea is to do it at a micro level rather than think so big that someday all silos will collapse. It's never going to happen. So, yeah. So, I hope that that makes sense to you. Right. Uh, Dr. Kishore, Dr. Hasya Dianti, she, she has a lot, she had a couple of questions for you. I'll take one. 
uh, where she asks, it will be easier for the people in the higher in the hierarchy when they have authority to to explain compelling clear goals to the to the team. How do people at the middle level or even at the junior level do the same thing? Okay. No, I think you can do it at every level. Um, I think what happens is so you're supposed to. So let me give you an example, perhaps. <clears throat> Um, so I wrote a paper many years ago, and I was looking at um, how technologies uh, that are developed, how they can then get to be used for other, other purposes. And the example I was looking at is the one I gave you earlier about the space mission. Uh, so if you look at uh, the technologies that we use, um, so you know uh, the trainers that we use for running, at the bottom of it is you know synthetic material, which is the derivative of what came out from the space. Uh, it was polyurethane, it's now it's something else. Um, then, you know, we take Velcro for granted, but we use Velcro everywhere. Uh, th that came out of the space suit and so on. So, you know, I'm talking hundreds of billions of dollars of use, which we don't even realize that came out of that. So the team, uh, the head of the team that built the space suit, I asked him, so how did you make these decisions about technology? And he said, he said we didn't make the decisions. We only asked one question, and the question was, will making the decision of doing this or that uh, make it easier for uh, a person to go to the moon and land? So in other words, then the decisions became much clearer. So what, what they did is, so they are not actually putting a man on the moon. They are designing a spacesuit, which is much lower down, right? But what they're doing is, they're connecting it very clearly with what the bigger goal is, okay? So I think that's number one. So what is your goal? Are you designing a spacesuit? Yes, you are. But what are you designing a spacesuit for? Well, putting a man on the moon. Or you could say I'm designing a spacesuit which should also function as something that you can use on Earth. I'm designing a spacesuit which is going to also work underwater, whatever it is. But the point is to be very, very clear about the goal. And this I notice with a lot of what you might call concern that you know all the teams that I see around me you ask them, what is your goal? Well, the boss says, this is the goal, but what is your goal? What is the one thing you absolutely want to do? Not clear. Not clear. Well, the boss tells me, no, 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 the boss doesn't tell you. The boss has basically said, you know, I need you to get this done. And, but that getting this done means five different things. Which of those five things do you, are you really going to get done? Then you can go back to the boss and says, look, you know, it's five things. I will get only one thing done. So, okay. Uh, and then the boss will understand your hierarchy. So, and if you have that clear, then you can motivate your team. That for the team becomes clear and compelling. So it's a question of cascading the goal, but are you clear about your goal? Because if you're not clear, then the team will not be clear, yeah, at a middle level, yeah, so. Dr. Gishaw, this question from Hafiz is asking you, how do you manage people who are always pessimistic and negative thinking into trusting people in particular? Um, okay, so, okay, so let me, let me, uh, let, let me try to answer this in two ways. Um, so I, I come from um, my, my home city. It's not really my home city. I didn't live there much, but it's also my home city. Uh, it's, 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 it's Calcutta, Kolkata, you know, which is in the eastern part of India and where the weather is warm and humid and muggy and it rains and and if you go outside in the summer it's actually quite miserable and this is not very different to honestly from a lot of places uh, where, you, where you live right um, so there's a faculty member uh, he was a colleague of mine at INSEAD uh, he um, at Fontainebleau when I was in INSEAD so he is from Kolkata he grew up there and he would talk about what is known as the smell of the place and he says, see, the surroundings have a big effect on uh, what you do. So, for example, if it's summer in Kolkata, you don't want to go out. You want to stay at home and you want to do what you want to do. If it's winter, it's great. You know, it's fabulous and all that stuff. In Fontainebleau, you know, do you want to go out in the summer? Absolutely. And where do you want to go? You want to go to the forests of Fontainebleau because that's where you get your inspiration. It's the smell of the place. Similarly, and he has written a lot of uh, stuff on that. Unfortunately, he passed away some years ago. His name is Professor Sumantra Ghoshal, and his work is what I'm referencing now. Um, so he talks of the smell of the place. 
And the smell of the place is not just physical, it's also organizational. And I think question number one you should ask yourself is, is the organization radiating negativity? Is the smell of the place such that, you know what, it's, it's, it's gloomy, it's muggy, it's humid, it's miserable, and I don't want to go there, you know, and therefore I'm negative, you know, I'm tired, I am, you know, I, don't, I feel like lying down and all that stuff. So I'm just trying to use a metaphor, right? So I think question number one to ask is, uh, what is the context of negativity? Is it the smell of the place? Is there something in the environment which is creating it? And honestly, a lot of environments are like that. They do not, really, uh, they, they do not, uh, they do not kind of radiate positivity, okay? So <clears throat> um, they do not uh, uh, radiate positivity. So that's number one. Second is, uh, is this, that I think, I think team members look up to the leader to give them emotional sustenance. And I think the second question you ask yourself is, am I doing this? Okay. So no matter how difficult the situation is, are you radiating some degree of positivity, some degree of hope, some degree of what you might call, yes, things are going to be okay, and so, and, and so on. And I see a lot of team, mem team leaders, and I've been there too, by the way. I, I put myself in that category. We are so weighed down with the problems that we, 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 without, without realizing it, we convey this to other people, right? And so on. So that's number two. And number three is, look, you know, if, if, if you've done all of those two things and if the organization is good and positive and if you are generally sending positive messages, then if people are still negative, then you talk to them and say, you know what, you know, don't, don't be this hangdog. You know, your negative is affecting everybody else. You know, go take a vacation, go stay at home or whatever it is. Then you can come, up, come after them. But I think I, before that, please make sure that those two other things you have a pretty clear handle on. One is, is the organization sending signals. Number two is the team leader sending signals. And then you can have a direct conversation with people. And I have had these conversations. You know what? Uh, you said this at the meeting the last time. It showed, uh, apparently, we can't get anything done. But in reality, we actually are getting a lot done. Maybe not to the quality we want. Maybe not to the level we want. But we are getting this done. Why not focus on the positive? So that's a conversation you can have, right? Try to bring them around. Okay? So I hope that that makes sense to you. Uh, I'll take three questions together, Dr. Kishor, because it's quite related. This is from Dr. Hasini, Cianizam, as well as Marhada. Uh, they're asking you, do you anticipate that after the pandemic is improving, we're going to work in a hybrid situation where you have combination of offline and face-to-face? -face? And what will happen to the social interaction, which is lacking at the moment, and does organization need to retrain their employees to adapt to the new norms? Okay. <clears throat> so there are some interesting uh, observations. So I'm working with, at, at the BBC, uh, they are doing a pilot in the engineering teams. Some people have chosen to come back to work. Some people have chosen to stay at home and they're working at home, like teams. And we're looking at um, why they did it and how they're working. And my observations are as follows. Uh, one is hybrid is not bad uh, because I think there are times you want people to stay at home and focus on the work. Uh, there are times you want them to actually come back to work. So uh, I hope one of the good parts of the pandemic is that it's not all or nothing. So we can have a situation where <coughs> maybe two or three days we work at, uh, in our offices and one or two days we work at home. Uh, so that's number one. I think hybrid is here to stay for good reason, because I think it's good for everyone. Second is, um, it has to be done carefully. So for example, one of the things I've talked about is uh, people need to actually be together, right? And so if it so happens that, let us say there are five people in a team, <clears throat> one of them comes on a Monday, one of them comes on a Tuesday, one of them comes on a Wednesday, Thursday or Friday, they don't see each other, right? So when you do the hybrid and face-to-face, Make sure you do a little bit of coordination as to who comes when. They get to see each other face to face. Maybe make it a little bit of a fun event that, <clears throat> like we try to do it. Tuesday, let's have lunch together. Okay, so people come on Tuesday. We work with each other on Tuesday. Thursday, let's go and have, you know, let's go in the evening and, 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 and get a cup of coffee or a drink together. Things like these. So if you make it a bit of a celebration and all that, then people will come with each other and do it. <clears throat> so I think hybrid is here to stay. Second is, but 
when you bring people face to face, you need to do a little bit of calibration and coordination. Do you need to retrain people? I think in the softer and subtle aspects, yes. Yes. <clears throat> a lot of the people have lost their touch. Um, uh, so what we took for granted, we can no longer take for granted. And that is the point I was trying to make earlier. So you need to redefine the norms. You need to redefine the values. You need to redefine you know, what the culture is. And you should do it explicitly. So you need to retrain people a little bit. I'm not saying a lot because we are essentially social animals. But please be sensitive to it. And what happens, I see this all the time, where the people come to work, they're a little bit skittish, they don't want to sit next to each other, and they are, they are, they are a little bit concerned and anxious. Now, part of it is because of health reasons, but the other part is social, right? Or the other part is social. And, and please, 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 please be a bit mindful about it. So, in the sense of retraining, that's a softer aspect of retraining. Rather, you shall attend a meeting, we shall all attend meetings, and we will start talking face to face from now on, okay? So it's more that, the softer aspects is, is, is I think you need, need to do a little bit, yeah? Thank you, Shoa. We have come to the end of the session. We have a lot of policy makers and decision makers in this group. Would you like to offer some parting words or word of wisdom to them, Dr. Fisher? Okay, <clears throat> so um, I, I'm not sure it's a word of wisdom, but I'll say a couple of things. <laughs> So what had happened is that so I've been in the United Kingdom for about um, seven years now. Uh, so after five years, you get to become a permanent resident, you know, something called leave of absence. So we got ours when, uh, just before the pandemic started in uh, 2020, a lot of it was face to face. You could see people were looking through paperwork and all that. Some of it was electronic. But then after that, you can get to citizenship. All of it was um, remote and you could see that you could not see uh, but, you know, these are civil servants who are working from home, essentially looking at your paperwork. And so there were some hiccups in this. And so, for example, one of them is that uh, they needed to get uh, biometrics uh, done and we had to drive to uh, Wales to do it, which is not a problem. Uh, I'm not complaining. But all I'm saying is that there were some hiccups. Secondly, there was one about time, how long it, it, it takes to get anything done. But I think what I was amazed uh, is that actually the thing got done. The thing got done, it got done quite well, right? And, 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 and work progressed. So I guess I, guess I would like to offer um, uh, two, two thoughts, right? One thought would be, uh, can we re-engineer our public policies in a way that citizens can utilize our services, whether they're working, uh, whether they're at home or whether they come, uh, come to an office, knowing fully well that sometimes they actually have to do something face-to-face. -face. That's number one, right? Number two, in the era of um, hybrid work, I think it's also quite important that <clears throat> the civil service uh, uh, folks get to meet each other and also get to meet the customers. So what would be the points of physical face-to-face -face interaction that you would engineer, which would actually be useful, right? And which, which would give a sense of empathy, which would give a sense that, yes, we are in there for you, and so on. So, so uh, so these two points of interaction, right? One is how will you rethink your services? And second is how will you rethink your interactions which are face-to-face -face, and what value will they, will they bring? And I think the third one is I think um, this is also a huge opportunity, right? I think we have digitized, we have, uh, we, uh, we know and understand how to work remotely and we, I think, have empowered a lot of people, honestly. To be quite honest, we have empowered a lot of, a lot of people who earlier were shy about, 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 about technologies and so on. How can we leverage this to take the next level? And the next level is how can we use it for learning and becoming a better society? So I guess three prescriptions, right? So number one is how can we re-engineer what we do? Second is how can we re-engineer our face-to-face -face interactions, not just uh, with our citizens, but also within civil service? And number three is how can we take this massive opportunity and leverage it to become a better society that is more digitized, more transparent, and, and, and sort of increases and, and, and use it for development. So I guess three, three points in here. Yeah. Kishore Shangupta, on behalf of Arasoji, thank you very much. It has been an excellent discussion that we had this afternoon. We wish you good help, Dr. Kishore, and we hope that the situation will improve faster. And we look forward to collaborate with you face to face, hopefully, uh, in, in the near future. To all our participants, thank you for taking time to participate this afternoon. We value your questions, your feedback, 
we apologize because of the time some of the questions cannot be answered. Please follow us in social media for future programs. Till we meet, till we meet again, please stay safe, take care, and thank you very much. Dr. Kishore, once again, thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very grateful that uh, you had me here. It was wonderful to interact and all the best. And I hope to see you in Kuala Lumpur. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye, Dr. Kishore. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Terima kasih banyak-banyak. Assalamualaikum.